everyone and welcome to Being Black in Britain, the podcast that captures the nature and the essence of the black experience across the UK, but starting with the north of England. Today we'll be speaking with Abby Shaw, PhD researcher from Birmingham, who will be sharing a little bit about her lived experience, her encounter with this criminal justice system and how it has impacted her lived experience going forward and how she intends to support black women just like herself who are on a similar journey. Let's go. Thank you, Abby, for coming on Being Black in Britain. Um, I'm really excited to explore um, your journey, what you're doing right now, where you're going with it, a little bit about your personal background as well. I feel like you've you've definitely got a story to tell and it's really going to be exciting, inspiring from what I've um, heard so far. And I do believe that somebody out there is going to benefit from your journey to date. So... Just to get started, could you just introduce yourself, tell me who are you, what do you do and why do you do it? Three questions. Okay, so my name is Abigail Shaw, mm. uh, PhD, third year PhD student yeah. Snap. <laughs> <laughs> um, in criminology and sociology. Uh, my research focuses on black women in the criminal justice system right. and how they uh, re-enter back into the community after right. they've been to prison or even after they've just had any kind of engagement with the criminal justice system. Yeah. The reason why I do what I'm doing um, is because of my background. Right. I can relate to the women that I'm researching. Right. We have a shared experience. Right. There's commonalities there. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I'm the best person in terms of positionality to yeah. really um, research that particular group. Yeah. Um, and because of my own experiences, that's why I kind of wanted to look at re-entering back mm. into the community because my experience of re-entering back into the community right. um, as an offender. Right. It, was, it wasn't the best. And okay. I think it was down to the support that I didn't receive. Right. Um, and the support that I did receive, it didn't make me feel comfortable and it didn't okay. make me want to engage or be motivated to yeah, even yeah, share yeah. my experiences. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so that's the reason. Can we, can we unpack that a little bit yeah, about the nature of the support? What is it that was missing? Um, cultural competency, um, culturally responsive. Um, the person that was providing the support, so the professional, right. didn't look like me. Right. Didn't relate to my experiences. Right. I felt at times as well I was being looked down upon. Right. Um, and it didn't seem like the person was there for the care. It was just for the job. Yeah. So engagement for me just didn't continue after that. Mm. So I, what I want to try and hone in on is that sort of engagement, having someone who represents that particular yeah. person who can end up either under understand their journey or relate in some way. Yeah. Um, and even if they don't relate or don't understand, kind of start the conversation where we can I can share my experiences with yeah, you and you're not yeah. ignorant to it. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of what I want to try and I want to move away from that and look at more therapeutic okay. methods. Okay. Um and and talking therapies as well. Mm. And then using community as as an alternative to prison. Okay. I like that. I think what's interesting there is looking at the representation from the professional standing point. I feel like where, in any profession where there's a disconnect between the staff and the service user, there's often like a, a lack of empathy, a lack of compassion, an unrelatability that almost makes the ser renders the service ineffective. Mm -hmm. My question is, in those services where there is no representation, how how do we establish a culture of empathy and compassion to ensure that that service is meaningful for the recipient, for someone like yourself or someone that looks like you? Like, how, how do we establish that, do you think? I think it should start with the training. Yeah. So I think the people that are already there need yeah. to be retrained. Yeah. Um, and then the new people who want to get into some sort of support, whether that be any... Um, department within the criminal justice system I feel like they need training on cultural competence right. competency yeah. and how to approach um, these individuals mm. uh, could, the thing is they can't shy away from it mm. because if you take it up as a job you've got to be open to deal with individuals from all sorts of backgrounds yeah. or walks of life yeah. so I feel like being trained on cultural competency and understanding how the person acts why they act the way they are I feel like that would definitely help the transition mm, mm, mm. And tell me about your PhD a little bit more. What what has been your choice of research methods? Why do you think that's the most effective research method? What what does that look like at the moment? Okay, so my um, PhD hones in on lived experiences. Right. So, and 
another th- another thing I'm trying to do is turn those lived experiences into a podcast. Right, okay. So an episodic podcast. So right. like every week there'll be a new lived experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and new challenges will be exposed. Mm. Um. What I found through the research that I've I've been through the literature review that I've been doing is that there is no lived experiences right. for the black women. Like there's no there's nothing out there that tells someone who's going through that journey kind of how to how to deal with a situation yeah. if it was to occur, especially yeah. within the criminal justice system. Mm. Um, so that's what I want to try and hone in. I want that authentic narrative. Yeah. Uh, what I've decided to do as well is choose uh, black. Black feminism, mm. um, because clearly the feminist, uh, normal feminist, conventional feminist theories, yeah. they don't, they acknowledge women, but they don't acknowledge black women. Yeah. Um, and also critical race theory is okay. also something that plays a part within my research as well. Of course. Only because it hones in on those inequalities that mm. black women experience through the criminal justice mm. system. And mm. then it, it hones in on intersectionality as well, yeah. which seems yeah. to be kind of like the buzzword that's going of around course, nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. And also that participation. So it's a participatory, participatory action research. I can never right. say it all in <laughs> so one. It's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, I usually just say part. But for those that don't know what it means, it's participatory yeah. action research. And what that means is that it's research by the participants for the participants right. and with right. them. So that way they're leading the, the, the structure mm. of the research mm. and they decide what they want to do with it. So even though I've just told you that I want to turn it into a podcast. Yeah. I am going to leave that open to, yeah. to any creative method. So if someone wants to tell it in a spoken word or yeah. in a poem or yeah. use photographs, mm. then they have that option mm. and they have that freedom to do that. Uh, also, I want to... I want to try and create a space. I want to make it a space. So I don't want to just finish my PhD and just call it that. I do want to continue further research. Mm. And I also want to create a space like alternate that looks like um, a rehab, a good rehabilitative space for mm. those group of group of women. So I do want to take this and try and turn it into something that's lifelong. So it doesn't yeah. just end with these participants. I continually yeah. getting new participants, you, you know, from young to mm. old, telling their experiences of the criminal justice system mm. and then putting that out there to the youth mm. to, for them to, to understand the process, but also for them to know how to act and how to manage those scenarios. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think that, I think that, 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 yeah, I think that will, that would help. I think yeah, it would be yeah. definitely beneficial. I definitely, Sorry, I I definitely th- no, 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 you're, you're answering the question. <laughs> I think one thing I'm seeing also there is just the power of storytelling because it's, it's the untold stories yeah, yeah. that nobody knows about, no one can appreciate. No, if, if you haven't lived it, you just don't know. So you're definitely bringing something new to the table. I guess my question adding to that is, are you going to embed the storytelling of your own journey in the midst of that or is it mostly about telling the story of others are we going to get to experience your journey and how that maybe impacts your research and just the way that you're engaging with the entire body of work hopefully if I get to if I if I get to do what I want to do with my yeah. research yeah. <laughs> in terms of creating a podcast because yeah. that's what ultimately what I want to do so I want to turn this research into a podcast that's yeah. kind of lifelong yeah um so if I do get that that opportunity, then yeah. that's kind of how I'd open it up. Yeah. Is kind of let people know who I am. Yeah. Why we've chosen this particular podcast, why yeah. we've chosen um data verbalization, right. storytelling podcast, yeah. and kind of give some kind of clarity on yeah, the reasons yeah. why I've decided to do my research that way and why I want to continue on that journey. Of course. So yeah, so okay. I definitely will be telling my story to give it some clarity. I love it because we because we want to hear it. I'm ready for, <laughs> I'm ready for that day. Because there's just so much to learn from people's journeys. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess my next question, again, going back to your PhD journey, what would you say has been a challenge along the way? And what would you say is a highlight of this journey so far? So three years in, you've seen a bit, you know. Mm. What's been a challenge? What has been a highlight? Okay, so my my challenges have actually started from the beginning. Right. So. When I actually applied for the PhD, because um, I'm I'm funded by the university, right, my okay. research is funded by the university. So when I actually applied for the PhD, I thought it would just be straight sailing. I thought, you know, it's just put in the application, yep. do your do your ten minute presentation, 
and then you get told whether you're going to be accepted or not. Right. Well, it was different for me because I've got a criminal record. Right. So the university as an institution has to take safeguarding very Double seriously. Yep. So the so because of my criminal offences, I was um, put onto a safeguarding register. Right. Right. So that means that I'm limited to the the work or career paths that I can go down. Right. So that means not working with vulnerable people, which yep. we know offenders are vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and not working with children. Right. So obviously as a researcher, that poses a lot of problems because yep. it means that a lot of doors will be closed. And especially yep. if I want to operate outside of the university institution yep. and start looking at organisations, mm. they're going to want to question, you know, my um, criminal record. Yep. So that's what happened with the institution. They questioned mm. it. So what I did is I appealed okay. the safeguarding and I won the appeal. Nice. So the process for that is... They want you to get kind of character references um, and basically explain how you have changed from, mm. you know, from your criminal behaviour or your offending, how your offending histories have changed yeah. up until now. And that's what I that's what I explained in my um, personal statement right. and from the character references. And that that was the biggest challenge, not knowing whether I'm going to be able to be accepted yeah. onto this PhD. Yeah. So that posed a lot of problems for me. Mm. On top of that as well, I hadn't gone straight from my master's into my PhD. I right. had, when did I start my PhD? So I had about three years. Okay. And I was just working just a normal office job. Right. So I hadn't been doing any research. I wasn't keeping up to date with the new um, mm. criminological theories that were coming out. Yeah. And so it was kind of a slow burner for me trying right. to get stuck in. It's like I had to kind of relearn mm. the theories um, and engage with the new literature. Yep, yep. Um, so again, that's challenging. Plus I'm dyslexic as well. So right. I just everything just seems like a task. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it all seems daunting. However, on the plus side, on the plus side of that, um being able to being able to take the lead with with research mm. has been good. Mm. Um, and being acknowledged as a PhD student yeah. and the praise yeah. and acknowledgement that I get for that. Because mm. even though I'm still on the journey and I haven't actually got the PhD yet, mm. you'd be surprised how many people stand up in a room knowing that I've got a PhD, that I'm working towards a PhD. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking to myself, well, if that's just happening and I'm just on, still on the journey, then what's going to happen? Well, how many doors are going to open for yeah, me yeah. once I get that actual PhD and I say, yeah, this is Dr. Abigail Shaw, what can you do for me and what can I do for you sort mm, of thing? Mm. Um, and being able to collaborate. Yep. Being able to collaborate with people like yourself, like-minded yep. people. Yep. And meeting new people because... I, I thought I'd met everyone that I needed to meet. Yeah. You know, going to prison, you meet so many different people. <laughs> it's unreal. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's been nice to kind of fit in mm. and for my work to be acknowledged. Yeah. Because I didn't have the best time on my master's. Right. Um, because my dissertation, it didn't get the mark that I wanted it to get. Right. However, the PhD opportunity has been able has meant that I've been able to mm. still carry on that research because mm. my MA is the same as my PhD. Yeah, yeah. Apart from that was secondary, and this is um, what's it? Primary research yeah. that I'm doing now. Yeah. So that I'd say those little things there, I'm still holding, but I'm still trying to navigate and I'm still trying to learn how to navigate certain spaces yeah yeah um because i'd suffer from imposter syndrome tell me and about it we takes know over my life but yeah. it's not even just that i have imposter syndrome um depression even this morning i cried yeah it just comes on yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i know that there's past traumas that i still need to deal with yeah. but i'm just i haven't been in the right frame of mind to accept that right. support right and I'm a bit apprehensive about seeking the support, number mm. one, because of the judgment from my community about yeah. seeking support. Yeah. And number two, because of the support that I've had previously, I'm just a bit apprehensive. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so hope, hope, hopefully, hopefully I'll start to feel a little bit more, more better and more included in certain places. But I'm guessing yeah. that just takes time. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, do you know what? I, I love your honesty in terms of the fact, yeah, acknowledging that you're on this journey. Because, you know, we always get to see the highlights and all the nice bits on people's lives on social media when they've mm. made it. It's like, you know, Dr. Such and Such. It's all nice, but not everyone really gets to see the struggle, the journey on the way there. So it's really interesting to see how you're navigating, number one, the sense of judgment when somebody hates, oh, actually, she's got a criminal record. I I'd love to see how 
that changes people's view of you when they step into a room with mm. you and then they hear, oh, actually, she's also a PhD student. She's educated. Um, she's working towards something. And I guess my question is how, how do you navigate that on a daily basis where you've stepped into a room where somebody knows about your background and automatically that might influence the way they engage with you? What, what does that look like? Have you seen that, you know, where somebody say, hey, is it? And they're like, oh, okay. Have you ever seen a behaviour change when somebody then comes into that information and how do you navigate it? You know what's funny? I haven't. Okay. I haven't experienced that. To be fair, usually I'd say, yeah, I'm, you know, a survivor of the criminal justice system, but I'm also doing a PhD. So it usually, right. it usually just comes out in the same kind of right. sentence. So you can you see the change in their face like all right, right they used to be an offender but you're doing a phd yeah so that's the kind of thing that i get like oh well done you've you know you've okay. come so far that but i've never ever got someone who yeah. knows my journey and has kind of over used that to kind of define who i am okay i think for the the, the people that i've been speaking to or engaging with for them they're overwhelmed by the experience yeah. They're, yeah. they're overwhelmed and sometimes I'm the first person that they've met who've been through that experience, yeah. who's been through the criminal justice system and is now doing a PhD. You're the first person I've met that's been through it <laughs> yeah, that way. Yeah, and I get that yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. But you'd be surprised how many... And I, I guess because I'm a woman as well, yeah. I guess, you know, you, in the, in the in a male domain, there's mm. probably a lot more um, mm. doctors who have had a lived experience of the criminal justice system. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess that was also a shock factor, like, oh, you know, black woman, been through the criminal justice system and then managed to navigate... Yeah. Um, through through her journey mm. and come become you know um, a researcher. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I've, yeah, I've never. Yeah, okay. And um, going back to the thing about choosing not to maybe access support or maybe being a bit apprehensive about pro particularly professional services. Mm. My question is: in the absence of maybe accessing professional services, are you surrounded by a network in any way, shape, or form that you? you feel is supportive and kind of helps you navigate this space in present tense? Yeah, absolutely. And um, the, it hasn't been easy yeah. uh, creating that network because it's a new network. Because yeah. what's happened is when I was going through my transition, in yeah. order for me to be able to think positively and make a positive change, I had to change the company right. that I was keeping. Of course. So yeah. for about two years, I isolated myself while right. I was studying. But what came with that was, I started to mix in different spaces okay. and I started to create new friendship circles. Mm. So those people that were there on the journey while I was isolating, I've kind of met them through my isolation sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. They're the ones who now I kind of lean on. Mm. Um, there's one particular lecturer at the university who has, she hasn't seen my journey from the beginning, but she's been there from when I first started my right. um, uni course. And she's been my champion. Right. So, I, and and she looks like me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she's seen potential that I haven't seen. Right. So, with that being said, that's where the, my motivation comes from. The mm. fact that someone's acknowledged me and can see my capabilities. Mm. That's what's made me kind of push forward mm. and keep on going and kind of um, feeds that tenacity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, need, we need a support system, don't we? Because I, I think about all the spaces I step into 99% of the time. Nobody looks like me. Mm. No one has the same background as me. But then the times where you do meet that one person that's just a couple of years ahead of you and mm. they look like you, it's really inspiring, isn't it? It it reminds you that, yeah, yeah, like there's, there's room for me in this market, you know. Absolutely. There's room but for me. But you know what's changed as well? When I done my undergrad and I wish there was more out there when I done my undergrad. Yeah. What I'm seeing now is that there's more... Um, People are doing more focus, black focus groups now. Yeah. So I'm part of a PhD group. Yeah. You know, it's for black students. Right. I'm also part of a woman's group, black, a black female right. group, um, empowering group. Right. Um, so these spaces as well where I can kind of learn off my elders because the, the, the women's, the black women's focus group is women that are older than me. Yeah. You know, um, so it's inspiring to listen to their journeys yeah. and hear what, what they've, how they've overcome That's certain it. things. And then sometimes I can even learn from them, them in how to cope with yeah. certain experiences, yeah. which has been great. And I wish I had that throughout my 
October. My journey through university, but it's just now starting to come to the forefront. Now people are creating podcasts more and creating these safe spaces for us to share. And I think that's brilliant. So definitely a breakthrough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now going backwards, all the way back to the beginning of this conversation, Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to track your journey in terms of pre-PhD. In what, what age... What age was it that you encountered the criminal justice system to where you are now? And what can you learn from that transition to that encounter to where you are now? Yeah, you are still on a journey, but what what, what can be taken away from that? So for me, right, my first experience with the criminal justice system, well, with with police, I should say. Okay. Wasn't wasn't a personal one. It okay. was from what I had seen and observed. Right. You know, um, family members going yeah. through certain situations, yeah. and I couldn't. I'd noticed that the police weren't dealing with them properly, or right. you know, they were mistreating them or mishandling right. them. Right. And it was always drummed into my head as well that you don't talk to police, you don't trust the police. So I had that preconception. Right but I'd never engaged with them myself. So okay. it didn't really matter the fact that I had that preconception because it yeah. didn't matter. You know, I've ne- I didn't engage with them anyway. Yeah. And even when I did first engage with them when I ran about the age 12, mm. I didn't take it seriously because it was a new experience yeah. to me. And nobody ever spoke to me about, you know how they do with young boys about stop and search yeah, and things yeah. like that. How, how to behave? conduct yourself, yeah. what to wear and, yeah. um, and the rest of it. Females don't kind of get that pep talk. Yeah. So... You just learn from experience. I think for me, the takeaway, and I don't know if it's a takeaway, Mm. but what I did learn throughout my experience is that, number one, it's even though you're a child, you still go through that isolation, the fear. When when you're sent down, you're you're taken away from your family straight Mm. away. There's no goodbye, I'll see you soon. It's just... Just take them down. Mm. And then when they shut that south door, it's the realisation that this is reality wow. for the next 12 months. So what I would say I've taken away from it is being able to be humble mm. in certain situations. Mm. Um, and don't be, a, don't be scared to express your emotions because that's another thing as well. When I was, even though I was a child, I was put in an institution Mm. which was predominantly white. Okay. So around my peers, I'm very extrovert. You know, I'm out there. Confident. Confident. But then in this place, I I don't know, I was like a little snail. And I just (laughs) went hide, went away to hide in my little shower. And that's, that's how it made you feel. So I think the biggest takeaway for me would be to be humble. Mm. Um, And also don't take every, don't take everything at face value or everyone at face value either. Because pe- like I've stated before, people will set you up to fail. Mm. And even in those institutions, mm. you've all, whether it be the the inmates mm. or the, the guards, do you know what I mean? I feel mm. like, again, cultural competency. Yep. <laughs> so because they don't know how to deal with it, mm. they'll treat you a certain way or judge you by your character mm. instead of getting to know you. And mm. it's the same with the inmates because yeah. I've I, I suffered, you know, r- racial comments from the inmates and yeah. stuff like that. Because like I said, predominantly white. Yeah. So I guess I guess it gave me thick skin as well. It was something I to was take ask, from how me. how did it change your personality? Yeah, like, thick how- skin. And you know what? While I was incarcerated, I was actually given a role of mentor. Right. So I was teaching... We were the same age, but Mm. those that were less um, adequate within English, I'd teach them how to read. Wow. Yeah, and we'd have one-to-one sessions. And even that was kind of enlightening because I'm thinking, well, at a young age, like I'm 14 and I'm being asked to take on this this role, this Mm. adult role. (laughs) So it was was nice. It was refreshing, but Mm. I was still in there. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So it was (laughs) short-lived. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting, though. I'm trying to think, like, so, you, so you're you're not in there with people that look like you. The 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 professionals serve the professionals don't look like you. My question is: was was it obvious that you weren't treated the same as the others, or what? What did it look like? How being different in the cell? 
with people that didn't look like you? Could you see visible differences in the way that you were treated? Or would it just be these off comments here and there? You know what? At the time, I didn't see it as being treated different. Okay. Because even though I had experienced, you know, racism or experienced being, you know, dismissed as such, um, it didn't... Yeah, it wasn't, I didn't, acknowledge, now I do acknowledge okay. it for what it is because I'm older now and I've, right. I'm experienced. But as a child, you wouldn't you acknowledge, yeah, I would. I didn't see it. Okay. okay. Yeah, and I don't think, they wouldn't have made it obvious either. Right, okay. Yeah, it would have been, you know, a comment here, a comment there yeah, where you yeah, can't yeah. really say anything about it. So, yeah, that, that was okay. the situation there. I want to talk about how you've grown from it though, because you've said there about developing a thick skin, but then when you went in there, you turned into a bit of a mouse. Mm. How would you describe your personality now in comparison to that? Like, how have you evolved? Like, what does thick skin look like? Because I know you said, you know, imposter syndrome comes at times, but yeah, like, how would you describe your personality and how it maybe impacts the way that you engage with the world right now? I think the metaphor of be feeling like a snail. Yeah. That was the initial okay. going in and, yeah. you know, not being aware of my surroundings it's a new space I'm yeah. around new people I'm yeah. scared so that's what I mean by but give it six months I'm <laughs> out there <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. you know what I mean everyone knew who I was yeah and and, I, and I'm that's how I am now right and now I know how to navigate spaces better I know how to act okay. in certain spaces yeah where as a child I wouldn't have known yeah so yeah so that that's that's how I've been able to deal with that yeah yeah and I guess going forward, I know you've already talked about how your research is to serve those that have been through it just like yourself. I know you've talked about documenting stories, journeys, whether it is through the podcast and other creative means. But I guess ultimately, if you were to die today, what what would you want to leave behind for those that look like you? What impact do you want to have made on those that have been through exactly what you've been through and are actually struggling to reintegrate to navigate society right now on account of what they've experienced mm. what what do you want to do for them before you die it's a bit heavy but yeah it is <laughs> <laughs> I've never really thought about it but what is it that you would have needed that you didn't have someone who had the experience okay. someone who had that same lived experience who could have sat down and said listen I've been through it and this is how I dealt with it. Yeah. And this is what you need to do. Yeah. Because the thing is as well, one size doesn't fit all. Yeah. So for me, isolating myself worked for me. Mm. Whereas for somebody else, it probably wouldn't. Yeah. And the transition probably wouldn't be as easy either. Yeah. yeah. They've probably got no support mm. in terms of family. So, or, or friends or, or even outside support. Yeah. Whereas with me, even though there was hostility in the home. Right. I still had that that element of love, mm. do you know? Mm. Um, sometimes the, the, the caring bit is a bit questionable, yeah, you know, yeah. growing up in a black household, yeah, you know, yeah. the, not really affectionate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and what I'd also do, I'd want to share my lived experience, but also tell them to take time. Don't feel like everything needs to be rushed. Yeah. Take your time, go at your own pace. It's a journey. It's a, it's a massive journey. Mm. And... You cr don't let your criminal record define you. Mm, mm. So that's what I'd kind of leave them with. And hopefully the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what? That podcast is going to be a juicy one. You yeah, because I'm hope, hopefully I can take it inside prisons as well. You know, wow. for those that are waiting to be released, yep. to see what it is that the prison has done to help that transition. Because yep. what I'm finding out is a lot of people are coming out, got no accommodation. Right. They've got kids, but there's no mediation that's been set yep. up to try and get those kids back or rebuild that relationship. Mm. Why is that? Mm. But you know what I mean? And if the, if it is out there, it's not visible. Yeah. And that's what we need to, if the support is out there, you need to show us why is it when we hit rock bottom, yep. that's when all these support services want to come out the woodwork. Yeah, yeah. Access but, but none of them access. are fit for purpose. Yeah, yeah. And g going back to one of your first questions where you said like, how would it change? How would professionals change? The whole culture needs to change. Okay. The whole system mm. needs to change. Mm. Once the whole system changes and starts to take on more employees that look like me, mm. you'll see that it, it starts to become more diverse and, and more open and transparent. Representation is the it's key word. It's mm. important. Mm. Honestly, my daughter, 
speaks me up every opportunity. Mm. And it's so proud to, it, it's so, um, yeah, it is proud for me to see, to yeah. see that, yeah. that I've had that impact on my daughter, that she feels that she can share it. Mm. She feels confident to share it. She's that proud of her mum that she, she wants to share. Right, we're finishing with this one here. Right, you're a mum. How is this, how is your journey impacting the way that you're raising your daughter now? How is your journey shaping the way that you are bringing your daughter up into this world mm. in view of the injustices, in view of your experiences? How much do you try to protect her, shelter her, expose her to the world that we <laughs> live in? What does that look like, being a mum? It's not easy. And I suffer from a lot of mum guilt as well. Because right. I, I always question whether I'm doing it right. Yeah. I mean, me and my daughter have been through an experience anyway. Right. From when she was little. I right. suffered from a lot of um, postnatal depression. Right. And we went through a situation where she was, wasn't was taken away from me, but I had to make a decision of whether I wanted to continue yeah. on the road that I was on. And yeah. I couldn't manage being a mum. So we... So bear, bearing that in mind, we've already, me and her have already had a sort of wow. experience yeah. from when she was younger. Um, and there's a there's a lot that I still need to tell her that yeah. I haven't told her. But when I feel comfortable enough, I will sit her down and kind of share my experience. But yeah. what I've tried to do is change my parenting style. So right. I've looked back at how I was raised. Right. And there wasn't a lot of support in terms of what to do when I'm released into the big wild world. Right. How do I take on challenging situations? Yeah. Um, how do I conduct myself yeah. in certain scenarios? And I felt like I, I had a disattachment from my parents to right. the point where I couldn't share anything with them. Right. Anything I learned, whether that be um, sexually or just how to behave came from the streets. So right. that's the reason why the yeah. risk-taking behaviour yeah. would take place. So with my daughter now, I've changed that to, to where she's more open now. Right. To the point where I think she's too open because she'll come <laughs> in and she'll start gossiping about her school friends. Right. And I'm, in my head, I'm thinking, do I need to hear this though? <laughs> like, this is a lot. Yeah. So I've just tried to change my parenting style, make sure that... Anything we do together, we're always open and transparent. Mm. Um, I make her aware of certain situations Good. that are out there. Yeah. Um, you know, so be aware of sexual predators. Mm. Uh, be mindful of what you're doing when you're on the road. Try yeah. and take your head out the phone and, yeah. and be aware of your surroundings. You know, just give them little pep talks. Mm. But I also want her to be able to confide in me. Mm. And I feel like I didn't have that with my parents. Yeah. Because I thought as though they, they were very hard, mm. you know, and... Um, yeah, they were very uh, authoritative. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't feel... They didn't give me that comfort inside right. where I thought, I'm going to go to my mum and discuss this with my yeah. mum. Yeah. Whereas with my daughter, I've got that. Mm. So I think just being open, honest and transparent and also using my ex past experience to say, come on, I've been there and yeah. this, ain't, this ain't looking good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that having been able to share that share parts of my experience with her for her to acknowledge certain situations, Yeah. then I feel that's helpful. But you never know until they grow and fly oh, the it. nest. This is it. That's Everyone it. always thinks as a parent, I've done a good job, I've done a good job, but you really you don't, don't know. until you know them. Until the, <laughs> like, I get scared sometimes, even as a 15-year-old, when she leaves the house, I'm thinking, please don't get no phone calls. Yeah. I don't want no phone calls. Yeah. But honestly, she's the total opposite to me. Right. Total opposite, Yeah. Oh, mate, it's a journey. I'm, I'm not there yet with parenting, but Lord help us when we get there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, thank you so much um, for sharing. I can't wait to hear the progress of the, the PhD. And then when you start documenting them journeys, I'm, I'm excited and I can't wait to kind of share that with the community. But thank you so much for being on Being Black no in problem. Britain. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We will definitely have to have you back soon because we've come across a couple of black women in education, in research at the moment. And everyone seems to be exploring the experiences of black women specifically in so many different yeah. aspects of the institution. So we're going to have to have a round table and, and, and share we ideas. Do, yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode to so make sure you don't miss the next one or the one after that and sure to follow us on all podcast platforms and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.